you want to be paid above average, if you want to make more money than the average tile contractor, it's real simple. You need to be above average. You need to do things that are above average. See, run your business in a different way. Run your business above average. Do more than the average contractor out there. Market yourself harder. Learn to sell yourself better than the rest. Study sales. Stay in contact with past customers. Let them know you're still alive. See, it's simple. Ask potential customers what they want. Yes, I said ask your potential customers what they want and then shut up and listen. See, if you do simple things like this, you will be above average. The average contractor is not doing any of this. The average contractor today is actively going out of business. They're going like this, all the way to the bottom. It's a nosedive. They, and, and the simple reason is because they're running their business just like everybody else they see. See, they're trying to be average. Everybody wants to be like everybody else. But if you're above that, if you can be above average, you can build the business you want. You can build the business you dream of. Hello, Tile friends, and welcome back to another episode of Tile Money. This is the podcast where we discuss the business of being a tile contractor. My name is Luke Miller, and I am on a mission to help tile contractors grow profitable, sustainable businesses. I am on a mission to help you grow your business into something you can be proud of, the type of business that's good for the industry. I started Tile Money with the intention of helping fellow tile contractors because I am a tile contractor myself. I feel like I've been blessed to help so many people already, but I feel like I'm just getting started. I feel like I can help a lot more. And thanks to all of you for listening and thanks Thank you for listening to this podcast, letting me know that it's helping you. Thank you for participating in, in discussions inside our Facebook group. Thank you for letting your reps know about this podcast. Because you've done all this, we're growing together. We're growing stronger together. We're sharing our success failures. We're sharing what's working. We're sharing what's not. And, and thanks to your support, people are people are taking notice and, and People are saying, we want to help you, Luke. So I've been able to attract some great sponsors. And these sponsors, these partners of mine, they share my mission. They share my vision. They say, we understand you are wanting to help people. We want to back you. We want to help you help people. We want to make this tile industry stronger. So before I get started in today's episode, I would like to just take a few minutes to thank my partners in, in this mission. Thank you to my sponsors who share my values and my goals. So the NTCA, the National Tile Contractors Association, they're the nation's largest professional organizations for, for contractors, for professionals, right? They've been around since 1947, so they have a lot of years of experience. The NTCA, they're focused on assisting their members grow and operate successful tile installation businesses. They do not want you to fail. They don't want you to be installing tile that will fail. They want to see you grow year after year. And I've been getting to know this organization in the last year or so. I've been getting to know the people who are behind this organization, the people who are, are working hard to better this industry. And, and these people, many of them are volunteers. And many of them have built up and run and operate great successful tile installation companies, businesses that you can be proud of. So if you're looking to grow and improve your business, I'm telling you, the best thing you can do is, is to join the NTCA, but you've got to do something beyond that. You've got to stay a little bit active. Start meeting people inside the group. See, it's not like a light switch. It doesn't exist. There's no, there's no on and off switch. You want a successful business? Flip this switch. It's not going to happen. You've got to get active. You've got to find people, your peers that you're going to look up to. Find your new best friends. And your five people that you want to hang around and you will start to change your business. You will start to change your life. You can find them inside the NTCA. Another sponsor of mine, Ladecree International. I love Ladecree. I value what they value. They are a customer focused company, a family company who Ladecree was invented, started by a tile installer right here in the U.S. How cool is it that the founder, Henry Rothberg, he literally invented Thinset in his garage. This is so neat. It's a story that doesn't get told enough. Right here in the US, A, Thinset was invented by Ladecree, the founder of Ladecree, and they continue to innovate to today. They lead the way in, in making products safer. They're taking silica out of the Thinsets. They are improving their grouts. Look forward to Spectralock One. If you haven't heard of it, check it out. 
Over the years, one of the best things about this company, one of the things that I admire most about this company is how they've maintained their core family values. It's not uncommon to see the CEO, the man in charge of the company, David Rothberg, walking around at coverings, introducing himself to people, meeting people, meeting contractors like you and I, shaking their hand and taking a sincere interest in, in you. And if you do meet him, if you do see him, go up and say, hi, introduce yourself. I guarantee he's going to ask you personal questions. He's going to ask you questions about your life, about your business, and he really wants to get to know you. Amazing company. Crossville, another family-run company right here. America's leading manufacturer of tile. They make a lot of their porcelain products, their ceramic products right here in the U.S., and they are leading the way in gauged porcelain tile panels, GPTP. Both the manufacturing of these big tiles as well as donating their time and energy to helping figure out how to install these things, best practices. So they are leading the way in, in GPTP. And if you're looking for a tile manufacturer, if you're looking for somebody who continues to produce high quality tile, easy to work with, I highly suggest you check out Crossville. All the links to these sponsors will be in my show notes if you're not familiar with them. All right, so in today's episode, I had the privilege to talk with Michael Stone. I interviewed Michael for this episode and another one after this. He's the author of the book, Markup and Profit. If you don't know it, check it out. There's a link in the show notes to Markup and Profit uh, to buy the book as well as his website, uh, markupandprofit.com, I believe. But I'll have the link there in the show notes. So uh, Michael has been helping contractors for a long time. He wrote that book back in 1998. So you can imagine, I was delighted when he agreed to do this interview when he agreed. He loves helping people. We had a great conversation and we talked about um, how to continually work up profitable estimates, you know, how to do this uh, with consistency. And so that was one of the first questions I really had for Michael was, what is, what is the common mistakes that he has seen over the years? What because he's worked with so many people, so many contractors, so many businesses, what is the common mistake that he saw contractors making when they worked up their estimate? And here's what he said. Uh, I've taught estimating in 44 different states. So I've had a, a wide variety of contractors that I've worked with. I think we figured out one time we worked with something between 74, 75, 76 different construction related businesses. And they all make primarily the same mistakes. The first one is with, with estimating is they use uh, uh, very few contractors have ever sat down and figured out a good method where they do the same thing the same way every single time. They, they do one estimate one way and another estimate another way. And then somebody over here tells them something. So now they change again. And so the, their approach to it is kind of like uh, <laughs> the old saying of they're all over the place, just like manure and bad news, you know. So I guess for, for an estimating is to develop a system and stick to it like glue. And, and one of the first things you need to do on that is have an, a, a paper written estimate sheet. In other words, you need to have a, um, a form that says this is how we do our estimates. We take off labor materials. And if we use subcontractors, we include them or and or other costs over here on the right-hand side. So you've got a complete list of all the different tasks you do and a labor material subcontractor and other cost list over here on the right side. And so you have a complete breakdown of your estimate as you go down through it. Down at the bottom, you total it all up. Then you factor in an error factor, and that, that applies to your ability and your history of doing takeoffs and what your error factor is. Most contractors, when I first get them, like our coaching clients, when we first start working with our coaching clients, most of them have error factors anywhere from 6 to 10% on every job. That wipes out their profit if they miss. So what he said was, one of the most important things, and I want to just drive this point home, one of the most important things that you can do when you're estimating is to have a process, develop a system that works for your company. I love how he brought out that you need to have an error factor built in to your estimates so that 
your profit is not wiped out. See, most people, their true profit, they're hovering maybe around 10%. If you get below that, if you get below eight, he said, you're going to go out of business. But if your error factor is 12% and your profit's 10, that's wiped out. So I asked Michael about some other tools, some other things we could be implementing in our businesses. And here's what he said about that. The one that I, I get most people to start doing is when they're estimating their labor to get rid of the square foot estimate on labor or get rid of the, the hourly stuff and start estimating, uh, especially if they know they've got an error factor of 4% plus, then they, start, they need to start doing their estimates in blocks of half days. In other words, if you know you got a guy on the job, you don't estimate one hour, you estimate four hours. If you have three hours, you estimate four hours. If you have two hours, you estimate four hours. If he's got six hours, you estimate eight hours. You estimate in blocks of four. All right. Now, over a period of six, eight, or 10 jobs, you're going to see your labor factor starts getting closer and closer to reality. Okay. And then you can then you can make an adjustment. Then you can go from the blocks of four hours to the blocks of three hours or blocks of two hours. If you got two guys working on a job, and 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 this will probably bring it home a little better. Have you ever noticed when you got a a, a journeyman tile setter working, and you got an assistant working with him? I don't care what you do; the job seems to take all day long. Even if they got at at two o'clock in the afternoon, they're pretty well done. The job seems to stretch out to four thirty. Somebody's paid it, and it's you. Okay, not the customer ain't paying it; you're paying it because it isn't on the estimate sheet. Other tools that that contractors can use to do good estimating. Again, the big one is do the same thing the same way every single time. On your estimate sheet, you should do what I call a line out. In other words, if you've got a an estimate sheet and you've got a list of everything on the, uh, when I'm looking at the camera, it would be everything on the right-hand side. You list all the different projects and then you have labor materials, subs, and others across there. And when you're doing your estimate, the first thing you do is go through and do a line out. You draw a line through everything you're not going to use on an estimate sheet. So your estimate sheet now pertains only to that particular job. Okay. Now what you will do with that, it cuts your estimating time in half for just about any job you're going to do. Because after a short period of time, two or three or four jobs, your mind starts getting trained so that you, when you see a line through something, you don't even look at it. You just go to the ones where you have an open space, like for, um, uh, you know, for uh, floor tile. And, you know, you're going to have so much labor and so much materials and stuff. And you know you're not going to have any subcontractors on this. So you draw a line through the subcontractor column. And once you get used to this, your mind will skip right on by those things. And, it, and, and you don't rehash that job every time you go down through your SME sheet. You don't rehash every line in there. You just go to the ones where you need to put in, put an entry, uh, put your labor material numbers, whatever it is. And that, of course, you know, when you eliminate all this other fluff and nonsense that's in there you're not going to use, it cuts your estimating time way down. And so um, I think, and I've, and I've trained a number of estimators to do this, really good estimators like on remodeling work. I don't know what my numbers would be for tile, but for remodeling work. Uh, good estimators can crank out $100,000 worth of estimates uh, per hour. Okay. And, and that's, that's, that's moving right along. But, you know, but you got to have a good system. Got to do the same thing, same way every single time. You got to do a line out on your estimate sheet. So when you go into it, I mean, it's just boom, 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 boom. boom down the way you go. Okay. You get, you get your numbers in from your specialty contractors. And that's another one. Um, don't guess at things. That's another one, a big trick. You know, if you don't know, ask somebody. If you don't know, send an email to a supplier or a subcontractor. Get your numbers. Okay. That's what we talk a lot about. And, you know, the, the guys, you know, well, I don't have time. Well, how come it is you don't have time to do a good estimate, but you got time to run all over town for three days after you've got a contract trying to figure out how to get the damn job built for the amount of money you put in the estimate sheet, which is, which is like 80% of what it should be. See, that's, that's the kind of thing. So this, this idea, I don't have time. It's just nonsense. All right. I love these tips Michael is giving us. You can tell that when Michael is talking, he's pulling from his experience, his many years of real life experience, helping business owners, small contractors grow their businesses. And he shared with me that his grandfather was a contractor who started his business back in 1915. And at the time, when Michael was a boy, he would go fishing a lot with his grandfather. And that's really when Michael's business education started from his grandfather's experience. So 
way back then and then all the way through the years until writing the book, Helping Contractors. He's helped a lot of business owners. So I love that he's sharing some of this knowledge with us. We're going to get uh, back to some of the things he said, but let's take a quick break here for some industry news. And when we get back to the interview, Michael is going to be sharing some, some great tips for how we can sell ourselves, how we can improve on our sales. So this industry news is sponsored by the NTCA. And I want to talk about um, these trade shows. You know, have you attended one of these industry-wide events? Have you are you planning on it this year? I want to, I really want to encourage you to make it a priority to attend at least one of these events. See, attending these events like coverings or surfaces or Total Solutions Plus, the reason it's a priority for you as a business owner, the reason I'm continue to encourage you is that it's at these events that you're gonna be meeting the people that you need to be associating with. If you're looking to build a, a successful business, something that's larger than yourself, I know how it feels. I know how small you can feel, how lost you can be at times, but the people there, they're eager to help you. And the key to attending one of these events is to be social. I would encourage you before you go, weeks before, start making plans, DMing and, and messaging people that you can be sure you wanna meet up with and make a list of the five or six people that you want to meet and make sure that, that you're making an effort to really go out of your way and meet them. Don't just let it happen to chance. Um, and I talked about this in, in my introduction a little bit about with the NTCA and the importance of hanging around the five right people. The reason I keep saying five people is they say you are the equivalent of the five people you are hanging around. So this is the best place to go and, and make real life connections, connections that will could last a lifetime. And for the NTCA members, I encourage you to show up a day before the event and, and start sitting in on the meetings like the TCNA handbook meeting. Um, this is a great place to be able to geek out and really get your tile nerd on. And you will be in a room of, a concentrated room of like 50 to 100 people at times. But these are some of the most successful tile contractors around. And when I say successful, you know, I used to think that they were only like super large companies that we wouldn't have anything in common. But a lot of these people, you know, remember success is in the eye of the beholder, just like beauty. So success is, you know, something that there's a lot of even small tile contractors there, one and two man operations that are successful by their rights. And if that's your dream, if that's your goal, go there and hang around these people, see what they're doing to work nine, 10 months a year, you know? Or if you want to grow one of the largest companies in the nation, you can do that too. If you want to go nationwide or whatever you want to do, you're going to find those people there. And I used to think that, you know, we wouldn't have anything in common to talk about. But the fact of the matter is, even the largest contractors in, in those rooms in, at these events, they're eager to share. They want to see you. They want to pass on their knowledge. And this is just a human thing. It's, it's something we want to do. We want to pass on our knowledge to our, our children or other people who look up to us and ask us questions. So don't be afraid of, of jumping in the deep end, so to speak, if that's what you're worried about. And just get in there, ask lots of questions, meet lots of people, and you too can build your successful dream business. All right, so back to the interview with Michael. You know, one of the most frustrating things to me and when I'm running my business or I'm having conversations inside the groups is when people talk about being competitively priced and people think they have to be a similar price to win the job. So I got to the point in my business where if somebody asked me that question, you know, typically it was like another contractor saying, are you competitively priced? I would just flat out say, no, I'm not competitively priced. And typically their jaw would drop or whatever. And then I would try to maybe continue the conversation and say, do you want to know why I'm not competitively priced? Do you want to know the difference? And that could lead to a good conversation. Most of the time it didn't, but I, I got to the root of the problem right away. And I just, you know, saw that we weren't a good fit. So I wanted to ask Michael what he thought about this notion of being competitively priced. And here's what he had to say. The main rule you have to remember is this. You have an option of being competitive. You do not have an option of being profitable. You're either profitable or you're gone. It's that simple. Okay. So when, when you start worrying and fussing about what other people's prices are, 
the truth of the matter is you have no idea in the world what their prices are. Okay. You don't know what they pay their, their, their dream and mechanics for working on the jobs. You can guess, but you don't know. Uh, you don't know where they pay, what they pay their office staff. They, you don't know what they pay themselves for their own salary. You don't know what they pay for gas and maintenance on their vehicles. You don't know what they pay for the tools or equipment, whether they buy new or they buy used stuff. You have no idea what the other guy's prices are. And here's the thing. We know from doing, you know, I've been studying why construction companies go out of business now since 1969. If you back up and check, that's 51 years. You know, the, 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 the people in this business, you know, they go broke from lack of knowledge. Okay. And, you know, they're, um, they don't charge enough for the work they're doing. You can't fuss and worry about what the other guy's prices are and what they're charging because um, you don't know what their numbers are. You don't know if their numbers are right. And based on the failure rate in construction, which is the second highest of all businesses out there, the only businesses that fail faster than construction-related companies are small software development companies. And that didn't happen uh, up until June of, 19, um, uh, June of 2016. Construction had the highest rate of failure there was. But now we've been surpassed by the uh, software industry. And isn't that good news? When contractors fail, it's almost always because they don't charge enough for the work that they're doing. They go, oh, I got to be competitive. No, you don't. You don't have to be competitive. You have to be profitable. You have an option of being competitive, but you do not have an option of being profitable. So this idea that I've got to be competitive is nonsense because if you stop and think about it, most of the contractors you know are going to be out of be broken out of business probably within the next three years. That will cover about 75% of them. If you're trying to compete with them and their prices are wrong, what does that make your price? I mean, it just doesn't make any sense trying to compete. You figure out what your costs are. You have you figure out what your markup is or your gross margin, either one. You come up with a sales price that allows you to cover your job cost, cover all of your overhead expenses, and make a reasonable profit, which should be no less than 8% of your sales price of your job. Now you got those three things covered. Now you go to the next job and you do that right down the road and you survive while everybody else is falling, falling away because they haven't charged enough for the work they do. And this isn't just a coincidence. This happens, I mean, hundreds of times a day in the United States, small construction companies go broken out of business, literally hundreds of, time, of times a day. And, and the worst part of it is we have information like what you're providing for your, your, your viewers and stuff. Um, Devin and I provide a lot of stuff, but even after all, our work, we've been at this now since 1998. All right. So you've heard it from me. Now you've heard it from Michael Stone. Stop worrying about what others are charging, friends. Stop worrying about being competitive. You need to figure out your own numbers. Figure out these three simple things. What is the job costing you? What is are your overhead expenses. So direct cost of the job for you to do the job. Overhead expenses, everything that's not related to the job, but you have to keep going in your business. Cell phones are an easy example. What is your profit percentage? Your profit must be built into every single job, every single price you give. So remember, Michael said, you have a choice, friends. Do you want to be profitable? Yes. Or do you want to be competitive? No, you cannot have both profit in competitive prices. So just to remember that friends, I hope I've given you something to think about there. We've got a tile money tip and today's tile money tip is sponsored by Latercrete. This is another one of those clips from the business incubator that Ron Nash taught back in uh, September in Minneapolis. So listen to this clip and I'm gonna tell you what I think about it. I am a recovering general contractor. I have <laughs> lost loads of money doing that. I've learned how to lose money in uh, project management. I've learned how to lose money at Latigree. Business as a whole is a series of ups and downs. Now, no matter what you do, if you find success, you will find failure. The best part about businesses that are successful is that they fail well. All right. So as you learn and grow and your business learns and grows, you will start to discover that you need this thing in your life. And this thing is called cash. Has anybody ever went to do payroll and had a little bit of freak out moment? 
Raise your hand. I can't believe it's not more than this. Everybody else is lying. If you have an employee, I at one time owned a company called Project Solutions. We were owner's representatives. I had 30 project managers on staff. I had an owner that I was working for, Liz Claiborne. We were building Lucky Brand jean stores all across America, and they were 90 days past due. 90 days. Okay. How many here, how many people have been strung out or contract? Like you get two hands up, right? Okay. What's that feel like? Anxiety. Huh? Anxiety. Anxiety, right? There's no better anxiety than being a business owner. It's pure. It's like the, uh, the pure essence of anxiety because you have this notion, I guess, in the back of your mind that there's some collection agency with like, I guess, dressed to the SWAT gear, ready to bust down your door and be like, hey man, you're late on your power bill or whatever. But for some reason, you build these demons up in the back of your mind and it just makes this massive anxiety. I have paid payroll on a credit card before. Has anybody else done that? No, I have, it sucks, don't do it. Um, and, I, and you only have to do that for so long before you start going, hmm, I hear that other business people don't do this. I wonder why. And generally speaking, you can go back to one or two things that happen in your business. And that is usually, and this is crazy, I should become a consultant, I should charge people for this. You're not bringing enough money in to cover your expenses going out. Right, Did, did you write that down? That's, that's like well, gold, I'm gonna use gold right now. I'm dropping gold bricks and you're not writing it down. So the reason I chose this clip and I love it is because of how real it is. It's, it's very real life example. And I love when Ron said, that if you find success, you will find failure along the way. Talk about real talk right there, you know? Friends, we're all in the same boat. We all make mistakes. We all fail at times. If you wanna hear me talk more about mistakes, a couple of weeks ago, I had a, a, a whole episode on it, on how to learn from your mistakes. The difference between a true failure, somebody who fails and doesn't get back up, and a successful contractor, they're both making mistakes. The successful one, the winners embrace their mistakes. See, they learn to love their mistakes because they know that they can learn their lessons fast. And as humans and business owners, we cannot be afraid of failures. We cannot be afraid to fall flat on our face. Just know that when you're falling, when you're tripping and falling, you're moving forward, right? So in business, you're moving forward. You're learning. Never stop moving. Never stop moving forward and falling. Fall often, don't be afraid of it, but make sure you're falling forward. And what I mean by that is you're learning that lesson, right? You're putting into practice the lesson that you learned from that mistake, from that fall. You're getting back up and you're, and you're going again. So I truly hope you enjoyed today's episode. I hope this has given you some nuggets to think about and some helpful advice that you can uh, take home today and start putting into practice. I'm keeping these a little bit shorter because I want you to take one or two nuggets from each episode and start applying them right away. I don't want you to be overwhelmed by this. So in next week week's episode, we're going to revisit um, or actually hear some new material from Michael Stone, the same interview that we had today. Just we, We're going to talk a little bit more on markup and profit, a little bit more on estimated, a little bit more on sales. So if you enjoyed today's episode, you're going to love next week's. If you feel like you could use some more help in your business, check out tilemoney.com and check out what I'm, I'm putting together for you to, to guide you through growing your business. So if you're benefiting from this podcast, I really would appreciate if you could leave us a review. Go to ratethispodcast.com slash tilemoney and follow those simple instructions to rate this podcast. I really appreciate it. So check the show notes for the links. Stay profitable, Tile friends. Talk to you next week.